The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town of Galilee, Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the name of the virgin was Mary. And the angel came to Mary and said, Rejoice, favored one, the Most High God is with you. Now she was troubled by the angel's words and pondered what sort of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Sovereign God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his sovereignty there will know no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have not known a man intimately? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit, she will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, Elizabeth, your kinswoman, has even conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for she who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the woman slave of God. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel left her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Rejoice, favored one. The most high God is with you. Now she was troubled by the angel's words and pondered what sort of greeting this was. After all, it isn't every day an angel visits but it isn't unheard of either. Although the angel no doubt took Mary by surprise that day, Mary had grown up hearing the stories of God and God's messengers coming to people, not just to leaders or prophets, but to regular people, to women, and enslaved people like Hagar. As we tell the story of Mary and Joseph and Jesus at Christmas, in Mary's time, people told the stories of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael, stories that reminded them of the faithful one's presence and involvement in the world. And so, although the visit was unexpected, it was not inconceivable to Mary. And as the angel explained the new life into which God was inviting Mary, the angel also told her of her cousin Elizabeth's pregnancy which was miraculous in its own way. Proof, if she needed it, that God's power wasn't just ancient history or a mythological origin story. It was manifest not just in the past, but was still at work in the lives of real people. And Mary understood she was part of God's ongoing story, the big story that includes us all. That sense of connection, of being part of something greater than ourselves, is so important to our emotional and spiritual well-being. We are not on our own navigating this complex and at times overwhelming world. We have each other, and we have God who knows us intimately and who comes to us to bring good news. Hagar was an enslaved person, the property of Abram and Sarai, better known to us as Abraham and Sarah, names God gives them later. The child in Hagar's womb was also Abram's, thanks to Sarai. God had come to Abram and promised him a son and descendants as numerous as the stars. And when Sarai did not become pregnant, she became impatient and took matters into her own hands, sending Hagar in to Abram. Abram went along with the plan, and Hagar became pregnant, as Sarai had hoped. But then Sarai became jealous of Hagar, 
imagining Hagar was looking on her with contempt because she could not conceive. When she complained to Abram about Hagar, he told her to deal with it as she saw fit. And the text says that Sarai dealt harshly with Hagar, leaving it to our imaginations what exactly that harsh treatment might be. So Hagar fled into the wilderness, a single pregnant woman on the run from those who assumed ownership of her body. What must have been going through her mind as she made her way? Where to find food, water, where to rest? Then what? Where could she go? How would she survive? And what about the baby? The possibility of finding a warm welcome anywhere was as remote as the wilderness in which she found herself. But the messenger of the all-seeing God found Hagar by a spring. The names used for God in this translation are wonderful, aren't they? The all-seeing God, the inscrutable God, the wellspring of life, the font of life, the faithful one the living God. Hagar is by a spring because water is life in the wilderness. And God sees her there and comes to her as life itself. God calls her by name. Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where are you going? God does not change the circumstances of Hagar's life. God tells her to go back to those who had abused her. But God promises that her son will live and prosper. And in that culture, a son was life for a woman, someone who would care for her in the absence of a husband. Like so many stories in the Bible, this one is troublesome. God sees Hagar. God makes and keeps promises to Hagar, but God does not free her. And despite Abram and Sarai's abuse of Hagar, God still keeps God's promise to them. And that is next week's story. But the mere existence of Hagar's son Ishmael, which means God hears, and the fulfillment of God's promise to Hagar is a reminder to Mary and to us that God does hear and God acts, even if God is inscrutable. God hears. Do we hear those words as promise, as Hagar did, or as admonishment, as perhaps Abram and Sarai did? Did they treat her differently upon her return? Were they surprised that God had heard her? I'm reminded of the story of Joseph, sold into slavery by his brothers, who rose to prominence in Egypt and was able to ensure his families and so many others survival through the famine. Joseph said that his brothers had intended something evil, but God redeemed that evil act for good. Mary knew that story too. If she had not known these stories, I wonder whether she would have been able to overcome her fear. If she imagined God was asking her to do this huge thing, this thing that would disrupt her entire life, if not ruin it, this thing that would bring disgrace to her family, and she did not know the stories of how God had worked in the past, if she had imagined it was all about her, well, she might have passed on that. But when the angel said the Holy Spirit would be with her, and that it was in the Spirit's power that she would bear God into the world and that God would be with her always. She trusted. Each of us has our own story, but we are part of a much bigger story, the story of God's work to perfect creation, to reconcile all things in the power of love. It's slow work, isn't it? The world is still in many ways a chaotic place where evil seems to roam freely. Isolating ourselves and our own stories or imagining we are on our own to make the best of it is not the way of life. Sitting alone beside the spring in the wilderness, running from circumstances, we can feel bereft and hopeless. 
sitting alone in our room wondering what life is all about, we can feel unmoored and powerless. And that is why the wellspring of life comes to us in those places, calls us by name, and invites us to remember that our story is also the faithful one's story. It's like one of those epic novels with intertwining storylines spanning continents and generations, only so, so much bigger. And the author of life has already shown us the end. Love wins. Whatever our daily struggles, love remains the most powerful force in the universe. And if we can connect ourselves with that story, that love is the power with which we engage the universe. God sees. God hears. God comes to us. That is what we celebrate in this season of Advent, the arrival of God with us. In the person of Jesus, yes, but in messengers in the desert, too. These four weeks of Advent train us to be alert for all of the Advents in our lives. I wonder then how God is coming to you today or in this season of your life. And how is God coming to us, the community of St. Mary's? Who is God sending as a messenger or is God speaking directly to us? What is our invitation? What are we being called to bear into the world? I hope we can have these conversations because we are not on our own, either as individuals or as a community of faith. We are part of God's much bigger story and in it, we find our calling and the strength and courage and power to live into it. Rejoice, favored ones. The most high God is with us. Amen. <laughs>